Hello everyone and welcome to the session in our Wandsworth Climate Summit. Um, the summit started early this week and we've already covered how to develop a sustainability strategy, air quality, um, as long... Uh, hello and welcome everybody. Um, so uh, welcome to the summit, it started early this week and we've already covered how to develop a sustainability strategy, air quality as well as young people's involvement in climate change. Earlier this morning we held our first council-led session where we heard what the council is doing to combat climate change and also from climate group Ashton on the co-benefits of taking action on climate change. This session is going to focus on waste and recycling and we're joined by some wonderful speakers. Uh, so we've got Councillor Sutters who is the cabinet member for community services and open spaces. We have Meg Butler who's from Parents for Future South West London. We also have Mike Singham who's the waste strategy manager here at Wandsworth Council and we have John Long who's education officer at Western Riverside Waste Authority and joining us for the question and answer session we also have Dougie Sutherland from Corey who operate one of the largest energy from waste facilities in the United Kingdom which is located on the banks of the River Thames. So the format of the session is going to be that we have the speakers and then afterwards we're going to have a question and answer session. Um, please do submit questions throughout um, if you submit them, uh, they'll be um, they'll come through to us and then we can publish them. Um, just note that we're going to be keeping a note of, of the questions as they go and we'll publish them as we go. Um, but when we come to ant asking the questions, we might group some of them together. We, we appreciate that um, lots of people have similar questions, so we'll probably group them together. So it might not be that the exact question you've asked is, is asked, but we will group them together as best we can and, and answer as many as we can that way. Um, also to let you know, we do have closed caption. So if you press the three dots on the menu, you'll be able to turn on closed caption for you and that may, may make it easier to follow. Also, please do make your pledges um, for what you're going to do and action you can take around climate change. And also to flag up that the Western Riverside Waste Authority is also offering a fascinating virtual tour of their recycling waste facilities where you can find out exactly what happens to your waste and recycling. Um, so they've offered two dates for virtual Zoom tours. One was on the 16th, so that's already taken place, but there's another one that's happening on the 20th on Friday at 1 p.m. So if you are interested, please do uh, email them uh, education at wrwa.gov.uk to sign up for the tour and we'll also put that information in the chat as well. So um, we'll kick things off and first of all we have Councillor Sutters who's going to talk about um, general things around um, our approach to climate change and around uh, the importance of waste and recycling within that. So Councillor Sutters over to you. Thank you very much. And just before I begin, I would like to say if you do get a chance to do the virtual tour of WRWA and you haven't done it before, it really is worthwhile. So as um, Andrew said, I am the Cabinet Member for Community Services and Open Spaces, which does involve waste. And we know that there's a really high level of interest in our approach to waste and recycling at the moment. Next slide, please. So next slide. Perfect. So we invited along a group of speakers who can comment and challenge us on our approach, because I think that's important. We need to hear all voices. As Andrew said, first up after me, we will have Megan Butler, Parents for Future. They're a grassroots organisation now spread across five continents working on the climate change agenda. And we're very lucky to have a branch here in southwest London. Meg will be followed by Mike Singham. Now he is my go-to person in the council for all things and waste strategy. So he will be great at answering your questions. Followed by John Long. He will talk about education. His role is the educational program of WRWA. We've put a very high store on education for changing and promoting behavior change. And I think it's very important both the council and WRWA to be aligned on this. And finally, we have Dougie Sutherland with us. He is not giving a presentation, but he is a panelist. And as the chief executive of Corey Riverside Waste, he again will be able to answer any questions you have on the Energy for Waste facility. Now, one thing I must point out is there isn't time in today's session to look at all the other issues such as littering and street cleansing but we're really happy to answer your questions. So if you want to put them through, please do, and we'll do our best to answer them. Next slide, please. I love this next slide, please thing. It's making me giggle. Okay, so 
addition, well, as many of you will know, we declared a climate emergency in July 2019. And our vision then as now was to foster a community living within our environmental limits. Now, that's a big statement, but it does actually mean something. And as part of this, we asked our residents and businesses to support us by examining what they could do to help us move towards a more sustainable future. And our waste strategy is just one strand of our work, but an important one, and one actually in which you can all be involved. Next slide, please. And here you have it. At present, we're in contract. Now, this is actually quite important. I cannot make many changes while that contract is in play. This is with Serco, who collects all your refuse, and it expires in 2014. So at present, we are looking forward to what does this mean and how we can embed low carbon approaches for our new waste contract that will start then. And there are many, many things we can do, building upon the efficiencies we already have in the system. And I'll touch upon that later because we do. Ahead of that date, I have uh, agreed to do a, a, a trial of food waste because it's important that we get that part right. You know, in many boroughs, it doesn't work as well as it should. And alongside that, we intend to give composting brins to 100 households so that they too can have a go at, at putting their food in there and seeing how that works. Although again, home composting isn't always easy, especially for food. Alongside this, we will be raising awareness of waste minimization, reuse and recycling through comms campaigns. We will continue those at all times, an important strand of our work. Next slide, please. And this is where we were, and this is actually where some people are still a little bit stuck. It really does spell out the problem. From the Industrial Revolution forward, uh, we gathered resources, we manufactured goods, and finally we threw them away. But of course, this relied upon an infant supply of resources, which we don't have. We know that we don't have that anymore. So we know that this has to stop, and it really has to stop now. Next slide, please. And what we're moving to, and what many of us have already moved to, is a circular economy. And the circular economy is a model of production and consumption which involves all sectors of society, from government to producers and retailers, as well as consumers, who've all got their part to play. And they all need to examine their relationship with waste and consciously look to reduce. By reducing, reusing, repairing, recycling, and refurbishing, and it's quite a lot to say there, but it is, we look to keep all materials in play for as long as possible. And I'm sure you can think of ways this has been done locally in the borough. For instance, we now have some zero packaging shops, and we also have upcycling of electrical goods at Rework. I would also draw attention to the fact that the government is moving on this agenda. They're using stick, not carrot. And in March this year, they came forward with the key principles around the emerging policy uh, for taxing those who do not have up to 30 percent of recycled plastic in their packaging. And that, that's a welcome initiative. We look forward to seeing that come forward. Next slide, please. And underwriting that circular economy, we have the waste hierarchy and the general principles are very similar. So at the top of the pile, we have waste prevention. That, that's the best thing we can do. Let's get that waste down. If we cannot get it down, then let's reuse it. Let's reuse it for something that, that society values and also get them to value the resources that we're putting into it. If we cannot reuse, then recycling and composting also are, are pretty high up and, and we need to have those within the mix. And finally, we have other sources of recovery and we've got anaerobic digestion and energy for waste. So next slide, please. Now, many of you will know that energy for waste is what? Wandsworth have adopted. We were early adopters of this and have been sending it to Belvedere facility since 2012-13. It does a number of good things. It produces electricity for up to 160,000 homes. That's not just Wandsworth. I can see that it's got 17 up there, but that's across the whole facility with all the boroughs that send their waste there. 
It also produces bottom ash, which is recycled as construction aggregate and air pollution control residue, which is recycled to create building blocks for construction. And I'm sure Dougie will be able to tell you some of the really quite important schemes in which these uh, materials have been used. I also think it's worth saying at this point that one of our efficiencies is to send all our residual days down the river on the barges because this does save a lot of heavy vehicle movements per year and it is the equivalent of 6,000 cars off London roads and I'm really quite proud of the fact we do that. It's more expensive than road but we think it's a sacrifice worth playing. Next slide please. So some of this you will know, we collect recycling and we collect residual waste. But what is interesting is that every time we do a survey, we find that there are high levels of satisfaction with the way it's being done now, which is why I'm so keen to do the food waste trial, because we need to make sure that that would fit in seamlessly. 81% of residents are satisfied with the refuse services and 73% with the recycling services. Wandsworth residents have also been really successful at keeping the low amount of household per person down. We're in the top eight London boroughs for the least amount of collected waste and in the top 20 nationally. Now, I know that we're often criticised for our overall um, recycling rate at 23.2. But I want you to remember this is only the way that the government league tables in the UK, in the England, actually not the UK, work. We recycle here mostly low weight materials. The only heavy material we recycle is glass. So we can never compete with those boroughs that have got, say, many gardens and, uh, and are doing green waste because that's a bulky thing and they will always be able to get that weight up where we cannot. So if you think about the composition of our borough, the number of high rise flats we have and the challenges we have to doing bulky collections, you will begin to understand why our figure is there. And then you need to factor in everything that's happening to energy for waste to arrive at a much more um, ambitious figure that I believe is the correct one for us, which is about 46 percent. Next slide, please. And I've added this slide in because it's a question I often get asked and I'm sure there's somebody on the call today who asked me this on social media about once a week. Where does my recycling go? Well, actually all over the place because it's a market. There are markets for different sorts of goods in different sorts of places. And this is just a snapshot in town of where it might have gone. And, you know, so we've got cans to Greece and Wilston. I mean, Amazing, but that's where they go and that's where they were used and that's what we're quite proud of. Next slide, please. So I'm coming to the end of this now because we've got uh, specific presentations from other people, but I just wanted to recap on some of the things I've said, which I think are impressive for Wandsworth. The amount of waste produced per Wandsworth resident has fallen every year for five years up to 2019-20 and I have no reason to believe that that will not continue. We have never sent our waste directly to a landfill since 2017-18 despite being accused of this on it doesn't actually happen. We are continually reviewing our approach within the commercial parameters we have in place but when our new waste contract comes forward in 2024, that is where you will see movement. That is where you will see innovative thinking and uh, new strands coming forward. And finally, our recycling and reduction plan. I've talked about this earlier. We want to do the food waste trial. We want it to be a success. And alongside that, we want to encourage people to compost. And so the trial of home composting will go ahead at the same time. And we will keep up those comp campaigns because it's very, very important that we keep telling the public what we expect and how they can help. So thank you very, very much for listening to this. And I will now hand back to Andrew. Thank you very much, Councillor Setters. I think it's great that um, you highlighted that waste is, is falling in the borough. 
uh, and I think that's important to, to note. And also um, introducing the, the idea of the linear model and the need to move um, from that take make waste approach through to a more circular approach. And also that stuff around the uh, uh, around the waste hierarchy is, is a key thing with uh, with waste and recycling. So I'd now like to uh, hand over to Meg Butler from Parents of Future Southwest London, uh, who's going to talk about what you can do. So Meg, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and thanks for having me, everybody, today. Um, uh, it's great to be asked to be part of this panel. And we were asked to pull together a presentation about what we can do um, as individuals to help with waste and recycling. So we've got lots of practical ideas here today. Um, but I'll also touch on at the end why you know that's not enough as an individual. So please don't feel overwhelmed by any of this. So just to introduce ourselves, um, I'm Meg, I've lived in London and Wandsworth um, for a long time and obviously now work here as well, given we're all stuck at home um, working. I've got three children at local schools, um, but I've uh, helped set up the South West London um, Division of Parents of Future, which is Council of Sutter said is a grassroots climate activism group. Um, we all came together out of you know, concern for um, what was happening with the climate emergency and, and a desire for all children across the world to have a, um, a habitable planet to live on. Um, and there's four main pillars of um, Parents for Future in terms of how we act and what's important to us. And a big part of that is individual actions and taking individual responsibility for this uh, problem and this crisis. It's also about encouraging adults to act, which is why I'm here today. Um, supporting young people is a big part of what we do, uh, whether that's um, in helping them to come to terms with the uncertainty that their future now holds, um, or in encouraging them in turn to help adults around them to take um, action. And a big part of what we do as well um, is lobbying for change. We delivered a deputation to the council um, um, last year um, around the, the climate um, crisis and what they plan to do about it. So just starting with plastic, I think um, plastic is obviously a, a big part of the problem and it's as the most tangible one, um, it's one that's perhaps easiest for people to get their heads around when they first start thinking around um, waste um, and the problem in terms of the quantity and volumes of it. And thanks to things like the David Attenborough documentaries, um, you know, we can't say we didn't know about this, this problem. I think everyone is very aware that, that plastic waste is a huge problem. Um, and just to put that into some sort of scalable context, um, there are over 8 million tonnes of plastic Plastic that gets dumped um, in oceans across the world every year um, and obviously that has huge implications for things like sea life, um, also in terms of um, entering the food chain, sea birds uh, getting caught up in, in things like plastic netting and um, eating uh, the, the microplastics. Um, but that also makes its way to our bodies as well. It's quite a shocking statistic there that we swallow a, a roughly a credit card's worth of plastic um, every week thanks to the air we breathe and water that we um, drink. Um, and the problem isn't going anywhere. Um, a million plastic bags are still used every minute. And um, part of the reason is plastic is a brilliant product that, but it was designed to be durable. It was designed to last forever. And yet somehow whole industries have sprung up around uh, this awful term, single use plastic. So plastic that's literally designed to be used for a few seconds at most and then thrown away and we really need to shift that mindset because when you throw plastic away there is no away you're just moving that piece of plastic somewhere else in the world it's not going anywhere um, sadly only 14 percent of plastic is recycled um, currently um, and the production is just going up and up and up um, all the time by 2050 it's estimated that um, plastic production will have tripled um, and it really is time that we take you know, personal but also systemic responsibility before we choke the planet on ourselves to death on um, microplastics and um, we won't be able to tell our kids that, that we didn't know this was a problem. Another part, though, of the, the waste problem um, is food waste. Um, and perhaps this is one that people don't automatically think about. Um, I think pe people think about plastic because they've seen it. Um, but, but food waste is easier to sort of put out of sight and out of mind. Um, and it's quite staggering that we have this, this, this food waste problem. It's huge. Um, and it's not supermarkets and restaurants, which people often sort of think of first when they think of um, food waste. Um, much of the waste is at the sort of consumption level at home. It's, it's people um, 
putting food in the bin that they've had before they've even um, cooked it or tried to, to consume it. Um, and that has a problem, not just in terms of the, the, the waste and the sort of contradiction when a and, and, uh, sad fact, we've got a billion people in the world who are going hungry every day. Um, it's also uh, has a huge implication for things like carbon emissions. So if food waste were a country, it would actually be the third largest emitter of carbon dioxide emissions um, in the world. Um, and the cost, you have to think about the cost of waste and sort of the, the two, two factors. So one, there's the waste itself, where it goes, what happens to it, the, the, the monetary um, waste as well. But there's also the, the, the emissions waste. We can't really talk about physical waste without talking about the impact on things like, um, like climate change um, and the carbon footprint of that waste itself. And it's interesting that other waste authorities, so the West London Waste Authority, has recognised food waste as their number one way to cut emissions. It's great that we're going to have a trial um, of, of food waste. We'd obviously like that to happen very, very quickly and, 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 um, and hope that that will be successful and be rolled out more widely because we would like to see our own waste authority um, make the same commitment to prioritising um, food waste going forward. And just to localise it, I've talked about some really big global waste problems there, um, but just in terms of uh, putting this into sort of a, on a local level. Um, in 2019, um, the Western Riverside Waste Authority produced 375,000 tonnes of waste and only 22% of that got um, recycled. So again, going back to food waste as a big part of this, food waste isn't currently recycled because we don't have composting and, and a food waste scheme. And instead it gets shipped down the river and incinerated. So on the one hand, you, you can think, well, it's great, it's not going to landfill, but it's going somewhere and there's a carbon footprint to that incineration. So if you think about the air quality locally, uh, people near those incinerators, but also the carbon footprint of that. There's two really big reasons why um, incineration isn't always the answer. And it could also save money. It costs um, about three times um, as much to incinerate food waste as it would to, to compost it. So this could be um, a win-win if we're able to move to uh, away from incineration into a more sustainable um, composting model. So what can you do about it? Some big problems there. And I say, I don't want anyone to leave this feeling overwhelmed. I want people to leave knowing that there is something we can do about this. Um, I've got four key um, things that I'd like everyone um, to have a think about what they can do to play their part within this. Three of them you're probably very familiar with, reduce, reuse and recycle. But the fourth one recognises about a recognition of the, uh, the, the, the problem uh, and what we need to do to address it on a global level. Just before I go into the first one of reduction, I just wanted to explain why that one always comes first. Um, Councillor Sutter's touched on this model as well. But reduction is really important in terms of there being less waste to deal with in the first place. And um, as I said, it's not just about the, the physical problem and, and getting rid of it. Um, it it's then the, the carbon cost as well um, of uh, getting rid of that waste sustainably. Um, and if you look at things like plastic incineration, particularly, that's got a really big um, carbon footprint. So if we can use less plastic in the first place, um, then we'll have a smaller carbon footprint on two levels, one from not having uh, produced the plastic and then but also then the secondary um, uh, waste um, and incineration cost of that as well. If you think about the, the cost in terms of money as well, um, you've got things like food waste, which is obviously you're putting money into the bin every time you waste your food, you're wasting the water that's been used to produce that food. Um, and all, reducing this should really be our first priority. Um, but we don't have time for those huge behavioural changes to take place. We hope they will take place, but in the interim, that's why we're pushing for things like composting instead of incineration as a more sustainable um, solution. So if we go on to um, reducing first and practical ways that we can do this, um, it sounds obvious, but buy less and then you'll waste less. So only buying what you need. And um, there's quite a good hierarchy of needs um, image here. So it's using what you have in the first place, um, borrowing, swapping, you know, things like local WhatsApp groups, um, free cycle, things like that can be great ways of keeping things moving rather than always reaching for um, Amazon or buying something brand new. Um, and things like... Um, at your food waste apps. There's other ones that I'll talk about later that help deal with food waste, but there are some that can help you prevent food waste in the first place, like Kitchy, we can just 
uh, help you do things like meal planning um, and, and shopping more sensibly um, and more mindfully. Um, shopping differently, so things like having no packaging. Um, it's difficult in supermarkets where everything is so packaged up, but a lot of local shops do sell fruit and vegetables with no packaging. Um, it's about making different buying decisions, so buying things to last forever as opposed to uh, fast fashion, which is literally designed to be worn once and then thrown away. And a big way to do this is just to think about what are you, what is the majority of your waste at the moment? So shifting your mindset and a great way of doing this is starting with um, what we call a bin audit. So just look at your waste over the week, uh, perhaps have a separate bag for different things like food waste so that you can see just what, what a sizable proportion of your household waste um, that actually is. And then having identified where the biggest problem is in your own home, um, pick a change you can make to, to that area uh, and make it a regular habit that you can stick with to actively reduce that. Uh, the next one is about reusing. Um, we've just put, we, we had a brainstorm as a group at Parents of Future and we talked about some of the things that, that are the sort of obvious um, reusables. I'm sure lots of you are using lots of these already, like shopping bags um, and coffee cups and water bottles, and they all replace those things that, that currently are used once, thrown away, but, but will take hundreds and hundreds of years, if not ever um, will never disappear. Um, using things like Tupperware instead of cling film, using things that you already have, but also it's about just reframing how we think about things that we've been told are disposable, you know, things like uh, plastic spoons, freezer bags, all those things that can be washed and used again and again and again. They, they are made of a product after all that was designed um, to last for much longer than a few seconds. Um, and then it's talked about just reusing things that other people in your community have and sharing more. Um, and seeing things as close clothing and books, you know, as, as pre-loved rather than secondhand. They make great Christmas presents even. Um, and, and then the redistribution of things that we already have. There's some brilliant resources um, locally and nationally that we can use. So things like Olio can help you get great food from local um, retailers and restaurants and the library of things. You don't buy um, a jet washer that you use once every summer. Try and borrow one instead. And then recycling. Um, you, we've got some experts on the panel, I'm sure, who can talk about exactly what we can and can't recycle. We can recycle some things, but we can't recycle much. And that's why it's really important that we do that mind switch and we think about recycling as a last resort. So rather think about just don't chuck away in the first place. Can you reuse it? Did you actually need it? Uh, could you have bought less of it? Um, there's quite a lot that we can't recycle. So food currently we can't recycle. Any sort of soft, crinkly plastic, so crisp bags or the film that comes across plastic boxes. Um, coffee cups um, and those plastic um, pint cups, a lot of those we're told are bioplastics or compostable, um, which is a, a, it's greenwashing really. We can't um, currently um, do it, get rid of any of those that way. And so you should assume that they're just the same as any other plastic waste that you, you, you can't actually get rid of. And black plastic we can't currently recycle as well. So it's not a fix all. We can't recycle our way um, out of this problem. But where we can, let's do it responsibly and do it right. And then the, the fourth um, pillar is just about recognition. So really, yes, do, uh, do, do hope that everyone goes away from today recognising that there are practical steps we can take and that we do have a sort of individual responsibility um, and a part to play within this. But also, I think we all need to recognise that the problem is too big for any individual to fix. And you could spend hours, weeks trying to adopt a, an absolutely perfect zero waste lifestyle, um, even having you know, zero waste toothpaste. Um, but the time that you've spent doing that, you well, one, you've made yourself quite depressed because it's very difficult to, to lead a zero waste um, life currently in the current system. Um, but also it's time you could have spent tackling the, the, the system head on. It needs us to join forces and do that. It needs large scale action. Um, and finally, we can't really talk about waste without talking about climate change. It's all connected um, and we, we all have to do our part, not just to reduce our own physical waste, but also our, our own carbon footprint and waste a huge part of that. So go away today and do your bin audit. Think about what you as a household, you as an individual can do. What's your plan? How are you going to stick to it? Um, but that doesn't just mean you're done. There's other stuff that you can do. So email manufacturers so they start designing out packaging waste and why is it more expensive to buy six individual unpackaged apples than a, than a plastic bag of apples when you're just going to put the plastic bag straight in the bin. Um, 
you could join a local or national activist group. We have um, a, meet, a new, meet, new members meeting coming up at Parents of Future South West London, and we'd, we'd love to have some new members. So please join us or any other local or national activist group because we're stronger together. And do things like write to your MP, write to your councillor, lobby. You have a lot of power as a citizen and as a consumer if you use your voice collectively. So please um, do ask for, for the change that, that we know is long overdue. And if you go to the next one, this is just us. This is us from um, Parents of Future South West London saying to make a difference on climate change, we don't need a handful of people doing it perfectly. We need millions um, doing it imperfectly. So we really hope you will join us um, on our last slide is coming up. We've got our, our social media handles. You can find us there and you'll find details of that uh, new meeting. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, Meg, um, it, it's really good to hear from you about uh, waste as a global problem and also uh, especially around plastics and, and that we can't recycle our way out of this and, and we need to do more and also um, highlighting what people can do about it um, a recognition of a problem is is a big part of it. Um, um, one of the themes for the summit is that we need to talk about climate change and, and, and that's an important thing. Um, so it, it's really good to hear that from, from yourself. Um, so next up we've got Mike Singham who is the Waste Strategy Manager. Um, and so I will hand over to Mike now. Mike. Hello, um, can I just check? I've, I've got my um, slides appearing. Um, no, not yet, Mike. Have we got them now? So um, they're not coming up quite yet. Um, so I think is going to try and do it now um, but Mike is going to be um, talking about what we do here at Wandsworth Council and about how we're trying to improve our environmental performance so I think everything is lined up for you now Mike I'm sorry I'm uh, pressing um, share tray okay there we are I think it's up live now Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. OK, well, sorry about that, everyone, but I, I'll try and um, steam through my presentation fairly quickly, simply because I know I know we're um, reasonably short of time here. Um, I'm just struggling with the view I've got in front of me, actually. Um, but yeah, OK, I'll go straight into my slides. So first of all, I just wanted to um, clarify the functions of the council and the West Western Riverside Disposal Authority. So the council is the waste collection authority, and that basically gives us the responsibility for collecting most household waste and recycling free of charge. But we're not responsible for disposing and recycling of that waste after the collection. That is the responsibility of the Western Riverside Waste Authority. And my colleague John from there will be telling you a bit more about them shortly. Now, the council and Western Riverside work very closely in partnership with each other. That's both to kind of coordinate um, collection services and the sorting facilities. So we couldn't uh, have single stream dry recycling if they didn't provide the facility for sorting that out. And we also work very closely together to agree campaigns to increase recycling and tackle contamination. Next slide, please. Um, just to uh, outline some of the council services, um, the, the, the waste collection that we do, the refuse is weekly and un unlimited. The recycling is also weekly and un unlimited, a single stream of it. Um, so we co-collect the mixed paper, card cartons, glass cans, plastic bottles, pots, tubs and trays. Um, there's two very similar but slightly different sets of services. So they provide the same service level, but low rise houses getting individual dustbin and sack collections get the clear sack recycling service, whereas purpose built blocks of flats and, and similar um, have communal uh, wheel bins for the refuse and a similar com uh, communal wheel bin for the recycling as well. But that accepts the same mix of materials. Um, there's also different performance levels between the two services. So what we generally find is that the, the low rise recycling with the individual sacks works slightly better. We get a slightly higher level of recycling and a lower level of contamination within that recycling. Um, 
Aside from the, the services that we provide directly, we also um, have a kind of permissive arrangement with charities. So we allow them to provide textile recycling bank services on street, and that is particularly good for um, carbon you know, carbon management because um, every tonne of textiles recycled saves um, something like 5.8 tonnes of um, CO2 equivalent emissions. Uh, next slide, please. So just um, starting to concentrate on how we can go about improving environmental performance and referring back to the uh, waste hierarchy, kind of triangular uh, illustration that the previous two speakers both both mentioned. So at the top of that hierarchy and where the biggest carbon savings tend to tend to be available is through reducing household waste. And as we've heard, Wandsworth is actually performing pretty well on that on that front, being the eighth lowest of 33 London boroughs at the moment in terms of household waste per head. Um, now, when you're when you're looking at um, how to go about uh, to reducing waste, um, you tend to concentrate on the residual waste going for incineration with energy recovery. And if you look at the composition of that waste, what you find is in Wandsworth, about 43% of it is food waste. Um, so that's costing us a lot of money to get rid of. As I said, reducing food waste, um, I think well, the, the factor for, for textiles was about 5.8 tonnes per tonne avoided. With food waste, I think it's about 3.7 tonnes of carbon emissions avoided for every tonne of food waste that you can make disappear or not create in the first place. Um, there's also decarbonising food and food waste. So we, we often think of food as a, a homogenous stream of substance. Really, there's lots of different things within there, some of which have much higher carbon impacts than others. So any move towards local produce, seasonal produce, and a move away from meat and dairy would have a similar impact in terms of the food waste and would go a long way to decarbonising that food waste. Moving on to home, home composting, whilst that's not kind of strictly um, waste reduction in that the waste still exists, it no longer enters the collected waste stream. So it doesn't get measured. There's no collection related impacts or costs. There's no disposal related or centralized disposal related impacts and costs. So, you know, the, 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 the effects of that um, waste that's being home composted, whether it's food waste or garden waste, are minimised. That is probably the lowest carbon route for that material. If and where it's practicable, practicable to do the home composting, it can be. You know, it's a bit more difficult if you've, you've only got a balcony or no outdoor space at all. Technically, it's possible, but the barriers are higher. Moving on to increase, increase in recycling. Well, as I said, the, the performance with the high rise properties using the communal wheel bins is lower. So there, there are big, bigger, bigger room for uh, improvement there. So we've done a number of um, trials with high rise locations, mainly council managed blocks of flats and estates. One of them is pictured there where we drawing on the kind of latest uh, research in London to emphasise the need for clean, smart, good labelling on the bins. Uh, so we put new bins in, made sure they're, they're very clean, very well labelled, and we combined it with um, providing sacks to the householders to help them carry it down from their flats on whatever floor it is down to the recycling banks at ground level. We've also experimented with some other things, um, optimising the location of these containers so that, for example, if somebody comes out of the block with a, with a bag of refuse to dispose of, the first bin they find isn't a recycling bin. So that hopefully helps us reduce the contamination. The other thing we've, we've, we've experimented with is just the, the apertures on the bins and, and locking, locking the lids shut. So if and where we've got big problems with pe people putting large bulky items of contamination in like refuse sacks, we can control it through, through that kind of approach. But increasing recycling, it's a lot about trying to educate, raise awareness, educate and explain how easy it is, how to do it and what the benefits are. We do that through our information channels on the website, on the side of dust carts, through social media, however we can really, and also liaising with the Western Riverside Waste Authority about annual uh, recycling programmes. 
The last thing I've mentioned there is new development. So there's been a lot of building in the borough over recent years and the waste team of the council puts a lot of effort into trying to ensure that all those permitted developments have got sufficient space to store the weekly arisings of waste, including separate space to store the recycling separately. And that enables the occupants of those buildings to uh, recycle, achieve higher levels of recycling than they might otherwise um, be able to do. Next slide, please. Um, moving on from increasing recycling, uh, there's also uh, improving the quality of recycling, i.e. reducing the level of contamination or things that shouldn't be in the mix. We do that, as I mentioned, through the apertures and lid locks on the, on the communal recycling banks uh, and optimising the locations of those banks. We also do it through big uh, communications campaigns in uh, liaising with the Western Riverside Waste Authority and the image here is an example of that that's appeared all over the side of dust carts and things this is just one of them there was other ones featuring pe uh, pizzas uh, sorry this is the pizza there was a nappy one as well because you know shockingly we do get um, a few of them in the recycling mix as well and moving on to D on the slide um, reducing the carbon intensity of waste services now the big other opportunity we've got there is with the um, scoping and tendering process around the council's next big waste collection contract that's due to commence in April 2024. So it's really about what, how can we change those collection arrangements in order to decarbonise the waste collection process and how might the council want to change the services that are currently provided in order to enable residents to achieve higher levels of recycling, reduce the overall carbon impacts of the waste that we collect um, in hopefully a cost effective manner. I've also put there just generally shifting waste up the waste hierarchy. So anything we can do to shift waste away from landfill to uh, energy recovery, um, from energy recovery to recycling, from recycling to reuse, or from reuse to simply uh, reduce the amount of waste that's created in the perp in the first place. It all helps to reduce the overall carbon impacts of our waste management. Last slide, please. So here I just wanted to present a few um, little statistics on the council's waste performance and the targets that it's setting for the future. So as we've heard, we've got good performance on um, kind of waste arisings per head. It's come down from 313 kg per head per year in 2015-16, down to 291, and we're targeting for 284 uh, by the end of 2022. Now on the recycling rate, it's gone up from 21.1 about um, four or five years ago, to 23.7 currently and we're targeting for 24 percent recycling during the current year. Now I should say that those figures exclude all the recycling out the back of the um, incineration with energy recovery and as, as Councillor Sutter's mentioned if you added in all that tonnage you'd actually be getting to about 46 percent at the moment. But when compared with other authorities, it, it is quite hard. I think Councillor Sutters went over that, but it's about, you know, the, the flatted nature of Wandsworth and the lack of, um, we don't have as much garden waste as a lot of rural and suburban authorities. Um, the recycling contamination, we're also making uh, small but steady improvements. The national average here is around about 14%. So we have come below that and we're seeking to get further. But perhaps the one of most interest here to uh, people attending today is the tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions to the atmosphere for every ton of waste managed. Now that is a rather complicated calculation. The Mayor of London has helpfully uh, created what he calls a ready reckoner tool to help the London boroughs calculate the carbon impacts of their waste management and different future scenarios that they might be looking at. And when we put in the the kind of the numbers for the Wandsworth baseline, which was decreed to be 2017-18, it comes out as a figure of minus 15 kilograms per tonne of waste managed. That might be slightly count counterintuitive. Why should it be a minus number? And I think the reason for that is about the, the displacement of um, you know, fossil fuel energy generation in the national grid from the energy generated from burning Wandsworth's residual waste. 
So what we've done is we've put the kind of numbers into our um, potential plans, particularly, you know, big um, uh, communications campaigns and the the food plan food waste trial and when we put the numbers into the the ready reckoner tool it says that if we achieve what we hope to achieve that should increase the carbon saving per ton of waste that we managed from the 15 kilograms to 48 kilograms per ton so i just likely to, to leave you that with that really it's quite a significant improvement in terms of the carbon efficiency of Wandsworth's waste management that we're hoping to achieve by uh, to the end of 2022 although I think you know I'm not sure COVID implications might just have some impacts on, on, on the timelines there but that's all I wanted to say thank you very much for listening we'll move on to the next speaker now thank you I've got no sound. I don't know if anyone else has. I think some speakers on mute. I think uh, Andrew might be having trouble. Andrew, just give me a nod. Do you want me to just start? Because I'm the next one. If Amy just uh, gets her um, slides, my slides up, that would be amazing. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, cheers, Andrew. Sorry. And then uh, I guess I'll. As long as everyone can hear me okay. You probably can't see me yet. This isn't Andrew talking without moving his lips. This is a separate person off camera. Uh, my name is John and I'm part of the Western Riverside Waste Authority education team. Oh, hello. Um, and um, I'm going to talk to you mainly about the education team because we're quite a specific part of WRWA. So I'm not really part of the, um, the main bulk of it. We're one of the policies that have been uh, rolled out by WRWA. But I'm the only member from that um, from that waste authority on the call. So I will quickly detail first what it is they do, like Mike was saying, slightly different remit. If you want to learn about that in more detail, because I'm only going to go over it very quickly, you can come on one of our virtual tours. I really recommend that. Uh, and then hopefully next year we also run tours in person, which I saw someone in the chat, Anna said she's been. And it is really good to come and see, I think, firsthand. Um, and we can go into it in much more detail. But I'm just going to quickly go through it now. Uh, so the next slide, please, um, Amy. Thank you. So um, WRWA have um, they cover four boroughs. It's not just Wandsworth, and they receive um, general waste and recycling from Wandsworth, Lambeth, House and Fulham, and Kensington and Chelsea. And they also in charge of running the public tip, which I'm sure a lot of you have been to at Smuggler's Way, where you can take a lot more things, a wider variety, so garden waste and scrap metal, getting down to quite specific things like Brita filters and things that you, someone was asking in the chat if you can recycle CDs and DVDs, and not in your household recycling. Household recycling has to be quite broad and the basic main materials we get, but you can get very specific at places like public tips. So it's worth going on websites like Recycle Now, finding out where you can recycle specific items. But they cover, as I said, the general waste, the recycling. The general waste is what you've seen. It's been this has all been talked about already, so you know about this. This is that's the stuff going to the energy from waste plant. Used to go to uh, landfill. WRWA doesn't send anything to landfill anymore. They switched to the Scandinavian model. But again, we want to see that as a last resort. As people have already been talking in the chat about the there's a lot of debate about landfill and incineration, and that debate can go on about which is the lesser of two evils. But the fundamental thing, which we all know, and Meg's talked about very succinctly, is how it, there is no way to. We need to look further up the waste hierarchy. So WRWA's main um, uh, goal is to reduce waste wherever possible. They do get all the recycling, which obviously is an important part of reducing our waste. Um, recycling is better than disposal. And that's all sorted because we collect everything all together. Our four boroughs are very inner city. So that's what the bulk of the smugglers waste site is sorting machines. And there are also a lot of people, about 35, 40 people working uh, on shift um, any one time, sorting through, doing quality control, taking out the things that shouldn't be in there. Um, and so the sorted materials at the end, you can see baled and stacked and sent on to reprocessing plants, different places depending on the material. So all within Europe, 
hopefully within this country, but some of that has to go overseas, but stays within Europe. The paper and cardboard go into pulping process plants that can be recycled five, six, seven times before the fibres get too short. That's why someone asked about shredded paper in the in the thing. Shredded paper, you cut and the fibres too short to recycle it, so it can't be recycled and it's hard to capture. Um, but again, come on this tour, we'll go through all the very specific things. I'll show you how to join the tour later. Um, plastic, very hard, bad to recycle. That's what, again, uh, as Meg was saying, it wasn't designed to be a single use material. It, it suffers in the process, can only be recycled once, maybe twice. That's why they make end of life products, things like the England football kit. Glass and metal, much better to recycle. They can be recycled in theory infinitely. They don't lose their strength. So you can put them into industry and build the shard. 90% of that is recycled. But um, we can't just switch over to that because there are always going to be problems. There is no single use answer is basically the point, because if we switch all the plastic packaging to metal and uh, the carbon footprint increase from the shipping weight, we'd, we'd offset that. There is no single use answer. So we're always looking towards moving things up the hierarchy, basically reducing. And one of the key ways that WRWA outlined to do that was education. And so that's where we come in. So I don't have a waste background as such, I'm more, more from an education background. There are three of us who work part time. And if you mind going to the next slide, please. Thank you. And um, what we do is um, we run a series of uh, tours and workshops with schools and residents and any educational facilities promoting the waste hierarchy. Um, we do this all free of charge to any anyone in those four boroughs, any schools in those four boroughs. We try and get as young as possible because um, well, there's two, two things we're trying to do. One is communication as well. There is that we're trying to communicate the policy, local policy, so people know about what you can and can't recycle. That's important and contamination because there are things we don't recycle at the moment. And the only issue is, is a communication one. So foil, for example, you could recycle that in theory if it was clean and balled up. And but we can't here because the vast majority we're getting was covered in oil and grease. So we needed to, we, until we get the communication better on how to deal with these materials. Same with aerosol cans, empty aerosol cans we said to recycle until recently because we're getting too many full ones, they're exploding. So we need to uh, make sure the communication is, uh, everyone knows exactly how to recycle. Uh, that's very important, but more important I think is the education side of things. Because what I'm seeing in the, the, um, the comments and the Q&A is a bunch of people who are really, really knowledgeable and passionate about this. But sadly, you are the minority and we need to raise that to reach a critical mass where enough people are aware of this and discussing this so that things start to change, which is actually already happening in the five years I've been working here. It's much easier to reach out to schools and residents, the Blue Planet 2 effect. Uh, there are much more wonderful organisations like MEGS, for example. There are much more won uh, wonderful initiatives being set up by councillors and local authorities all the time. So it's, it is starting to happen, but we need to raise that critical mass. And the way to do that is education. We target primary schools predominantly to get children at their behaviour forming stage, because from an education background, we know it goes kind of goes against common sense. We would think that behaviour is influenced by attitude, but it's the reverse. We adopt behaviours from all sorts of reasons, usually around what people around us are doing, and then we adopt the attitudes to go alongside those afterwards. So it's about starting behavioural um, from a very young age. We go from nursery upwards and we do, we've do. we dealt with over half of the um, primary schools in those four boroughs and rising actually, we're getting up towards two thirds. And um, when they come every year, we, we, we try and either get them to see the waste firsthand, um, which is good. We try and make things as tangible as possible. When you see 350 tonnes of recycling there, you realise that that's still too much every day, regardless if you recycle it or not, that's still too much waste. Um, and we try and give them tangible things they can do. We do waste audits in their schools, for example. We go through their classroom and see where they can cut their waste. And then at the end, we tell them how many trees they will save by recycling that paper, or how many they'll save by reducing it by using these recyclable bottle, uh, these reusable bottles rather than um, single use ones. We teach them what their actions um, what effect they'll have and also try and give them from a young age a much wider sense, a uh, broader sense of um, where all of their products come from, the link between natural resource consumption and the products they're using and the effects of, of deforestation, for example, or, or over mining bauxite and where that all comes from. Using things that might engage them, we can use things that are tactile, they can feel them, so they mem remember we, we, we try and make it very uh, experiential thing. We can use things like Minecraft to engage them if that's the way they like to be engaged and talk about resources. There's all sorts of ways we try and target them to engage them in this topic, but also talking a lot with design students. That's the other thing we do. We get a lot of design students either from things like packaging design or engineering students 
who promote the circular economy to, to design out these issues in the first place. And they're coming up with some wonderful schemes. It's really great to see. Like uh, there's a scheme that's being rolled out which by one of these um, students in a campus, a, a reusable scheme where they have a bottle where, with an Oyster card reader in the bottom of it. So all the students now, instead of getting bottles of Fanta and Coke, they go with their reusable bottle, which they've topped up like an Oyster card, put it on the dispenser. And if these schemes, it sounds small, but if, we, if they become um, rolled out uh, countrywide, they have a much bigger impact than sorting out the recycling. I see a lot of discussion about getting recycling exactly right, and that's true, but we want to make sure we still, as Meg's saying, focusing our attentions in the right area. It's a bit too late. There is no way to uh, single use sort of solution to it. Um, it has to be a huge, big policy change. And the quickest way to achieve that is um, is getting, um, is the recognised stage, actually, as Meg was saying, and getting it so that that's the majority of people, not the minority of people who are passionate about this and knowledgeable about this. So if you take down that uh, number, uh, that email address there, if there's any of you want to come on one of the virtual tours, you find out exactly how everything is sorted and things like that, but also um, local schemes. And also if any of you have children uh, in a school in our four boroughs, um, they may well have already come on a uh, tour, but if, um, if they haven't yet, encourage the teachers to get in contact with us. We're, we're running them on Zoom at the moment, but uh, hopefully return to physical things as well. But we're still running our schools program online trying to engage as many as possible. Oh, right, I don't want to go on for too long, so because I, I know that um, there's Q&A is very important, so I'll stop there. But thank you very much, everyone. And um, thank you for joining. Fantastic. Thank you very much, John. Um, really good to hear from you um, and, and hear about the work that Western Riverside are doing. So we've got a time for um, question and answers. So the first question is to Mike and Councillor Sutters and then also possibly Dougie from uh, Corey, who's here as well. Um, so um, this question comes in uh, that says energy from waste is a good method. However, incineration of plastics and waste materials are now shown to be big con contributors to CO2 pollutants. So will you aim to reduce this significantly by 2024 or better find an alternative to energy from waste? Uh, if I if I can um, come in there, uh, I think I think it's fair to say that the council is keen to um, help reduce plastic waste and to recycle as much of the plastic waste that um, does occur in the, the household waste stream uh, as we can. Now, uh, in terms of the council's direct services, um, that's restricted to recycling plastic bottles, pots, tubs and trays, which is quite a standard um, part of the mix which uh, local authorities focus on. That's some of the more easily, easily recyclable forms of plastics. Um, the big form of packaging that that doesn't include is the uh, packaging films. Um, however, we do, we do uh, try to kind of promote uh, awareness of the facilities to recycle at least some of those films at local supermarkets, which you can do with um, uh, along alongside carrier bags. Um, I don't know whether Councillor Sutters has got anything more to add. I expect uh, Dougie Sutherland from Corey might well do, but thank you. Not really. I think you've covered it there, Mike. What I would say is that over the years that I've had this portfolio, we have increased the amount of plastics that we can recycle. And I, I think the direction of travel is good, but I'm sure Dougie can tell us where we're going next. And we're, we're, we're keen to hear that because we want to recycle more and more. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not sure I have uh, the the answer for it. I think I think it's we've got to get it out of the waste stream before it gets sent to uh, as residual waste, either to landfill or to uh, an EFW plant. And clearly, in Wandsworth, nothing goes to uh, landfill, so that's good. But the worst situation, of course, is people throwing out plastics but into their black bin bag and it being landfilled and being left there for future generations. That's the that's the worst outcome. Uh, uh, the only thing I would add, actually, out of you know technical interest, maybe, is that uh, we we re not only do we want it out for all the good environmental reasons, and you know we all live on the same planet. It's actually a plastic damages uh, EFW plants. Uh, so not only is it, it does it create uh, you know uh, non biogenic carbon, uh, the, the the chlorides in plastics they damage the workings of the plant, which make it more expensive to run. So you know, w there's not much we can do about it once we've received it. 
uh, you know, we'll burn it and generate uh, electricity from it. But we really supportive from both a uh, personal point of view and from a technical point of view of getting plastics out because it's not good for us. A lot of people think uh, EFW, they like plastics because it's high in, uh, in calorific value. Uh, but our job is to, you know, is to process waste safely uh, in, in communities. Um, and we don't want high calorific value uh, plastics, you know, in our waste stream. It's not good for us at all. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, our second question um, is uh, around um, improving awareness so that we've had several questions around um, what can be recycled, what can't be recycled and more information on locations to recycle things and what are not accepted in the orange bag scheme. Um, so that's a question for uh, I think Mike and Councillor Sutters maybe and they've also uh, also been some questions around um, an update on the trial of smart bins so if it's possible to, to provide that as well that'd be great. Okay well if, if I come in there first of all again and and, and let Councillor Sutters add or subtract anything she she, she, she wants to. Um, the mix of recycling that the council collects as a single stream is determined mainly by two factors. One is the sorting capabilities of the plant operated by the Western Riverside Waste Authority, and the other is the availability of end markets. So if, if Western Riverside can sort it and there's an end market for it uh, to recycle it into a new product, then potentially we can add it into the collected mix. But there's all sorts of other things that can be recycled, uh, not in that single stream service that we're providing, but elsewhere. So we also try and raise awareness about that, where, you know, where can you recycle a Brita filter or, you know, what can you do with your food waste? How can you recycle textiles? Um, and it might be, you know, there's a bank over here or, you know, flagging up things like, um, ha have, have you considered trying to sell the item? Have you considered trying to give it away on, you know, Gumtree or something? Um, or free cycle. Um, so we pr we try to promote and encourage a lot of uh, other forms of recycling and, and ways that people can exchange unwanted items between themselves and pass it on to somebody who might actually want to uh, do something with it. Thank you. I think you gave a good, very good explanation there, Mike. And of course, we do want people to think of creative ways to get rid of their waste rather than just putting it straight into their bins. Waste is just things you don't want anymore, things you have no use for, but other people may. There was also a question about smart bins. We've been trialling smart bins for a year now in areas of um, low volume waste to see whether we could cut back on the number of times that uh, we need to empty those bins. And it's been a real success. We haven't found mess around them and we intend to roll more out around the borough. I'd also like to say that within our town centres and other high traffic areas, we're looking now to put in split bins so there'll be recycling and general waste with there and you'll be able to recycle within the street which you haven't been able to do so now and again in the parks we're doing the same so opportunities to recycle going up all the time fantastic thank you um there's also a question um uh, well lots of comments and lots of questions coming through about um food waste trial and people are really pleased that there's a food waste trial and potential composting and have asked uh, when these are likely to start and also how they can get involved. Uh, so I think I better take that one. Um, we're still working on the parameters around the, the food trial and um, the food waste trial and I look forward to announcing it soon, but I can't give you any details at the moment. It will be on one area of the borough. We're going to pick it from, from low rise because that is the easiest to, to do in the first instance and see how it goes. The composting trial will run alongside it. We'll be giving away 100 composting bins to low rise properties to see what effect this has on the volume of, of rubbish and how people feel about the two different streams. I think it's different people who compost to those who might want to do uh, food waste in their own food waste bin but I will announce as soon as I can I think it's important they get this right because if the trial goes wrong it's going to be very difficult to recover and uh, and to look at this in future 
That's great. Thank you very much. I think this is going to have to be the last question because we have overrun. Uh, we have had an awful lot of questions and we try to, to group them together as best we can to, to pick out the main theme. So I think that the final question is for Dougie uh, uh, around how um, we limit emissions and pollution from energy from waste. That was a recurring theme in, in, in the questions and comments. Dougie. Uh, OK, I mean, I think I think of emissions in, in, in two buckets, actually. So there's what I might call greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and then there's what I'd call air quality emissions. So when we think about it and we think about where we put our investments and the things that we can do, we, we look at how we reduce uh, reduce both of those. So uh, it, it always comes back to produce less. You know, it, the, we, the, the amount of waste you produce drives the amount of emissions. And so that's always you always get the we always get our biggest bang for our buck by reducing the amount of waste we do. And that's proving to be a really, really difficult thing, actually. And if you look sort of internationally, it's quite interested in whoever showed the slide of the kilograms per person that uh, we're producing in Wandsworth. I think that's quite a bit below the national average, because in the UK, each person produces about one point, you know, one five kilograms per person per day. In Holland, when you think, you know, they're doing a great job, they're about 950, 960 grams, so just under a kilogram per day. And Japan is about 9.25, having got it all the way down from 1.1 kilograms in about, uh, you know, 1990. So they've worked hard to get it down still to quite big levels. So that ultimately is the, the thing that we have to change, actually, is the amount that we produce. Then, you know, once you get down to the point when you've reduced the amount and you've taken out all the recyclables, you, you know, you're going to send it somewhere. You've got a choice to send it to landfill or you're going to send it to EFW. They're pretty well the choices. People are in this country exporting and London does export quite a lot of its waste. Uh, but I think that that doesn't solve the problem. That's just pushing the problem to somewhere else. And I think everyone pretty well has got their head around that landfill is, is particularly bad. And the best solution we have at the moment is EFW. For us, it's it's the big stuff and the little stuff. So for Wandsworth, you know, we are probably I think we're, the, we're certainly the only one in the UK and we're the very few in the world that's, that's, that's trying to reduce, reduce emissions. We've already talked about getting vehicles off the road. That's not just an emissions issue. You think of the vehicles that are, you know, producing NOx, particulate matter and carbon. I think strategies will bring those vehicle emissions down by themselves anyway, but we need vehicles off the road to make the roads safer as well. So we, we, we move them onto our barges, which automatically reduces it. So for us, so you've got to think from end to end. For us on our barges, we're looking at uh, new fuels. So we're, we're just doing a trial at the moment so we can we can stop using diesel and that will have a huge impact in, in, in emissions. Uh, and as we're starting to invest into a new fleet, we're looking at uh, hydrogen ele electricity and the technology in that is moving quite quickly. It's not great yet, but we will certainly invest into, you know, moving away from using, you know, uh, diesel type products there. Once you get to the uh, energy from waste plant, the first thing to say, these are highly regulated by the Environment Agency and they are pretty stringent in terms of making sure that we continuously monitor all of our emissions. And, you know, there are things that we can do to uh, to reduce, you know, our, our levels. But we are working with a very stringent uh, uh, environment. But what we also do just to give people a bit of confidence is that you know, the boroughs around uh, where our plant is in Bexley, uh, they all they all have independent monitoring stations which look at what are the emissions from uh, the plant and they they pick up on NOx. PM 10, PM 2.5 are the main things that they do. And they can't actually pick up any reading from the plant at all uh, where we are. So that's independently done. I think it's run by uh, King's College London. That doesn't mean to say there aren't emissions, by the way. It just means that clearly in London, there is a background level of emissions. So there are emissions coming out, uh, but they're lost in the background because they are very small in comparison to what you know what the rest of the emissions that we produce but what we do is we start to invest in new filters uh, uh, new technologies new uh, ways of taking more and more of the pm2 out which we could 2.5 which we could we can't actually measure ourselves it's just so small uh, and reduce nox the carbon is is a is a is a more difficult one uh, so while we produce less carbon than you would do by sending something to landfill 
where landfill produces methane really so it's a carbon equivalent rather than carbon dioxide itself uh, so while it's better than that we've got to look at else what else we can do and some of the things are about uh, making sure that we run a plant which is much more efficient so providing electricity which is what we do to lots of houses means that you don't have to build other technologies to provide that electricity so it offsets quite a significant part of uh, uh, the carbon that's produced somewhere else uh, and one of the things that we're really uh, keen on is pro providing heat uh, and so we are supporting a major development at uh, uh, Thamesmead which you know it's, it's in, in development at the moment for about 25,000 houses and so we're looking to provide heat for that and I think finding ways that we can be more efficient is really important. And I think as all the speakers have said, we'll get the, the bad stuff out, the plastics, and that will go to reducing CO, the CO2, you know, uh, and, um, and, and that is really, really important, actually. So I think that the policies which government are bringing in, what people are doing locally, that will have a really positive impact on uh, reducing carbon. But then you're left down to what else can you do? And I think one of the things for us is to constantly look at what are the latest technologies, what 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 is more out there. And I think we, we are, for example, looking at things like carbon capture. It's relatively new technology for uh, uh, for this industry, but I think there's so much investment and energy going into these sets of technologies that I think this will come to our market reasonably soon. And we have to be realistic. It has to come at a uh, a, a, a price and a, a technology which is uh, deliverable and affordable because the price of that just comes back in you know in our in our taxes effectively because the government ends up paying for it so we are certainly to give you confidence we are certainly looking at those technologies to see what else we can do so there's a whole re line of things that while EFW is the is the cleanest and best way of dealing with uh, waste moving on to the river gives us you know, a much better strategy for dealing with it. There are a series of other things that we just got to keep on looking at. So, uh, you know, I can rest, rest assured we, we are looking, you know, very closely at all technologies, but I would absolutely emphasize, get reduce the amount of waste and take the plastics out. That has more impact than anything else. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that, Jackie. I um, really appreciate your, your comments there. Um, so I'm afraid we've come to the end of the session. Um, we, we've overrun, so thank you very much for uh, for sticking with us. Um, um, I, I hope you found that very interesting. I just want to thank all of our panellists and speakers for coming along and giving up their time and, and speaking to, to everyone. And I hope that all of you watching have found this very, very useful as well. Um, so just like to emphasize that we've got um, more events happening over the next couple of days um, around the, the ones with Climate Summit. So it'd be great if you could um, have a look and, and see if there's anything else that you, you want to, to take part in. Um, and also, again, I, I want to plug the um, Western Riverside Waste Authority virtual tour Sorry, um, Andrew. To, sorry to interrupt. I, I forgot to pick you up on this earlier. Th those two for this week are already booked up. But do oh, you yeah, already booked out. Oh, we've, we've 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 scheduled a lot more. Uh, um, so we've got two on the one on the twenty sixth of this month, second of December, and there are loads more. So do get in contact. But those are booked up for this week. But we'll get you on one within a couple of weeks. Fantastic. Thank sorry. you very much for that. Um, yeah, no, that's that's really good to to know. Um, so we don't want people to be watching this and then uh, and then. Um, uh, not be able to. Apparently, there's there's a link in in the chat uh, in in the questions for that. So um, I just want to thank you all again, and uh, we hope to see you at another session.